Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. You're on uh, Hoboken Talks. That's our live broadcast show from the Upper Gallery, brought to you by the Hoboken Historical Museum. Uh, if you're watching live, that's great. Uh, let everyone know they can join us on either YouTube, Facebook, uh, or Twitter. And this program has been running well over a year. Uh, some of our past guests have been uh, uh, Tammy Fay, Jack Silbert, Carol Cusack, uh, Stu Chicharella, uh, Michael Turner, and uh, we're continuing the tradition tonight of having some great folks on, or one great folk, I should say. Uh, again, the name of the show is Hoboken Talks, and you can sign on uh, if you're a registered YouTube user and text and make a comment. And tonight, uh, here we are, August, and we are interviewing Paul Drexel, which was lined up months ago, probably at the beginning of the summer. Here it is like the end of the summer. So Paul Drexel, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Bob. It's a real pleasure to be here at the Historical Museum, a real legendary place now in the city of Hoboken. And we're still here, <laughs> which is proud and live. Bob. Yes, definitely. Um, so, you know, I've known you a long time, actually, if we you think about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to guess it was from the mid 80s. Right. Maybe something like that. I think that's right. Yeah. Tom Vazetti yeah, time yeah, period yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we, I'm kind of excited. We'll probably do a little nostalgia. Yeah, that's always a and, good thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we probably, we're always in a rush. But here we are, we get to talk for an hour. Sit back, chill out a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Great stories about Hoboken, yeah. And you sent some great pictures of the family growing oh, up. Thanks, Could you Bob. sort of thanks. intro our background yeah, here? Yeah, the, 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 the lovely family behind there. So we grew up on Tenth and Willow, above what was then the Updown Cafe, which wasn't a cafe. It was a real authentic bar back then. Many a broken window, you know, people flying through it. But uh, so the gentleman in the red tie is my is my father, that's Al Drexel. That lovely woman in the middle is my grandmother, Agnes Ethel, who also grew up in that apartment uh, that we grew up in, on uh, two floors above the uptown. The lovely woman above my head there, who I'm hiding for the most part, is my mom, Virginia Clare, who went by Ginny and smoked many a Kent cigarette in that, in that apartment. <laughs> and uh, above you is me, Bob, the, the with the guy, the eyes that look like the Kodak, Sorry. the Kodak uh, flashed a little bit inside there, and then uh, in the red shirt is my oldest brother Bob, who unfortunately just passed away this past May, mm. and uh, and then my brother Tom is behind him in the blue, and the little guy on my elbow there, that many an elbow we threw at each other, is my brother Rich, and he lives down in Orlando for many many years now. He's a Stevens graduate and uh moved down and he is an engineer down to florida many years ago so so, so that's the four <laughs> boys four brothers yeah, yeah in yeah. the house yeah four boys and, and uh was there boxing uh, boxing and i'm proud to uh, say that i have 63 stitches and many of them are due to those gentlemen that are around me there so who look so uh angelic in their christmas uh garb but weren't <laughs> always so angelic you know in uh and, the, and that's our Christmas tree behind there too. So, um, so yeah. So that's uh, that's how, our. Family. So how big is the apartment for four kids? So you know, it's funny. It's sort of a we go back and forth. It, mo most people who've grown up in Hoboken, everything is a little bit of myth and legend, and and then there's fact. So you try to you end up <laughs> mixing those three together. So um, the front room is where the four of us lived, and that overlooked uh, Willow Avenue, where the Willow Avenue bus would go down. And uh, nice and, quiet, and room. nice quiet road. And then also uh, 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 every ambulance that was going to St. Mary's would would zoom by uh, our our apartment. And uh, so that was the front room. The next room was my mom and dad's room, which had those uh, pocket doors, so they would close them when they could. Uh, uh, but not often, and then because uh, we were running like Tasmanian devils. And then uh, the next room, there was an additional room, which my grandmother stayed, and um, then a living room, and then the kitchen, which is which was off. So the door to the apartment was in the living room, and then the uh, kitchen was the back where the fire escape was. And then our fire escape went down one more floor, and below it, we didn't have a yard. That was a store called Muser's uh, um. when uh, 
when I was a kid growing up. And uh, so, you know, that was a place we'd go adventure and, you know, and fortunately none of us ever fell off the roof there, but uh, which is kind of a miracle. But, uh, and Muser owned our building. He owned the building we lived in. I think when my folks moved from there in 77-ish, they were paying, I think, I think he just got a rent raised. I think they were paying $68 a month or maybe it was 73. I think there's some debate in the family there for uh, for that. But yeah, and then my grandmother and mom grew up in that same apartment. But uh, I don't know so many stories about their time there, but obviously it got much bigger. And uh, But we were a fortunate family. My dad was uh, ran the uh, art program in the city of Hoboken. He was a World War II vet and went to school on the GI Bill. Had originally wanted to, went to Seton Hall, got a degree in chemistry, wanted to become a doctor. That didn't pan out. So he uh, went to NYU and got his degree in art and education and uh, ran the uh, art program in the city of Hoboken for many, many years, uh, from whatever 40 something until he passed away in 1980. So, so running the art program, meaning like he taught art or correct. there? Correct. Were... He was the supervisor of the art program in the city. So every school had an art teacher. His, um, his studio uh, class was uh, in Demarest and it was on the top floor. And as a little kid, I'd go up there and it was very cool. And, uh, and then in the evenings, he taught a Cooper Union in the city. He was a real, you know, uh, artiste guy and uh, spent a lot of time downtown. And we would, so I was very fortunate to, I didn't bring pictures of us uh, spending a lot of time downtown in the city, like swimming in the fountain in Washington Square Park, uh, watching Philippe Petit when he uh, uh, walked on a tightrope there before he walked uh, 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 in between the World Trade Center. Uh, we were just little kids hanging out there. And there was a club called Bradley's where a lot of great artists, uh, including de Kooning, who actually painted, he was a house painter in Hoboken. Pops knew him a little bit. And uh, so they used to hang out at this place called Bradley's in the city and Jackson Pollock, all these crazy guys and, and other, artist musician and I was a little runt kid and we'd uh we'd go in there and uh you know I don't really remember the stories because I was just you know very sure. young boy at the time so. so you know a lot of times we'll talk to folks who grew up in Hoboken uh and they'll talk about how they never went into uh -huh. the city that like you didn't really need to go <laughs> into the city right, right, right. uh but your your we were your parents yeah. had a uh, yeah. a broader outlook yeah, and yeah. that's pretty cool. So yeah. those were important influences. Just getting out of so. town. Absolutely, it was, and you know, in New York, of course, was like a. I actually have friends. I went to Brand School, and and um, up until eighth grade, then I went to prep in Jersey City. But um, and there was a reason for that. I was the youngest of four boys, and at the time, I think at least the legend. Here's where the myth and legends become, whether they're fact or not. Was at Hoboken High School at the time. Was one of the first high schools in America that was having metal detectors in it. So it was like, okay, you go to prep because you know of what's occurring at the high school now. But my three brothers all went to Hoboken High School before me. Uh, and so we're talking high school for you is seventy two. Seventy. Yeah. You graduated seventy six. Seventy six. So you in go 70, in seventy two. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but our, the city was a great influence for us and. Um, very, very fortunate to have that experience. We, we were go to museums, really took advantage of Manhattan that way. But I tell that story about Brandt because I had friends who later on in life, even now that I'm friends with, who would tell me, and one in particular who will name Nameless, who has never been to New York City. And proud, <laughs> and proud of it. And I'm 63 now. Yeah. <laughs> so um. we were, I met him in seventh grade mm -hmm. and he's 63. He, retired as a, a job here in Hoboken. And he says, why would I go to New York? I have everything I need here. Why would right, I go that right. way? So it's we used to get that with the museum where, you uh -huh. know, we, hey, we're trying to start this museum. And then we'd meet uh, <laughs> that certain individual. You go, you don't need a museum. I got the museum in my head. <laughs> <That's so great. laughs> and we would say, well, can we display your head? But I, I think you need it. So there well, those you issues. Because you have your podcast. That is true. That is true. A digital one. Yeah. Um, so maybe afterwards you'll tell me who this person is. Yeah, I'll we'll, tell you after. Yeah, we'll yeah, get him yeah, drunk yeah. and we'll kidnap oh, him no, and he, go into the city. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. He's a pretty big guy, though, so it might take more than Oh, I think I knew who it is. <laughs> you probably do. Did he used to have red hair? No. Oh, no, okay. No, no, no. 
Sorry. He was he was a public employee for the city for many okay. years. Okay, yeah. sure. You mentioned your uh, grandmother was yeah, uh, yeah. a Stella I, city employee. You know, it's funny. My brother, uh, Tom, who's a much, much greater storyteller than I am, he's the gentleman up there in the, in the blue shirt. Here's Eric Hammer, 1976, a great graduation year. Absolutely. Um, okay. Do you guys, did you guys ever meet? Do you, I, don't think so. I don't think so. Eric no. grew up a few blocks from here like what 13th well he'll tell us 13th yeah, yeah. and uh, uh garden bloomfield where did he go to high school that's the, oh yeah that's the, so, that, eric will have to tell us where he went right. to high school yeah, yeah right but uh um what were you asking me uh, I, I spaced um <laughs> so sorry oh, oh, my grandmother in the middle oh yeah, yeah the grandma yes so, um so the reason i mentioned him was her name is agnes ethel but when I was growing up, and she's born in the 1800s, which is really quite remarkable, right? So who's born in the my 18th? grandmother in the middle? Yeah, okay, yeah, like 1899. Yeah, no, no, a little bit earlier than that. Okay, but, but he would know the exact date. He might even text in with it now if he's watching. But uh, the um, I would always call her Ethel Agnes, and but her actual name was Agnes Ethel. We always called her grandma Ethel. So, but she worked for the city of Hoboken. The story is, and I probably have a few years off for about 66 years. Wow. And Just like Jimmy Farina. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in fact, I think Jimmy started at the same time. Okay. In 1899. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, she would tell great stories and just had various jobs for the city. One during the depression. And I remember because she used to call them dresser drawer babies. And so that was people who were, of course, didn't have cribs. They would open up a drawer and keep their baby in there at the time. And so she used to go down. To, she was a, a a little bit of a, a you know a tough lady too. Right. Uh, he, so Hoboken Eric's at Thirteenth and Bloomfield, and he went to Hoboken High School. Okay, yeah, so. got it. Got so it. so the um, she she would get up in her late seventies and grab an umbrella or something and tell how she used to go down to the piers and uh, or to the bars and whack these uh, longshoremen in the head to make sure they got home to take care of their, their dresser drawer babies and families because many were abandoning them at the time. And stuff sure, and, uh, sure. But the other great story of grandma, whether it's fact or fiction, but uh, in our family it's fact, is that she worked sort of like Jerry Fallow for a while for the city. And- uh, She gave, worked really hard. Oh, you know, absolutely, yeah. nobody works harder than her. But, but um, she um, gave uh, Frank Sinatra his first gig in in church square park singing in the gazebo there with the hoboken five i think it was or the hoboken four whatever it is and uh the four the four yeah so she uh she was one of the uh, interesting yeah, dad yeah. knew that family you know they were from sure right by brand school there right and stuff, yeah, right so. so i don't you know so it, here your father has a pretty good job your grandmother has mm -hmm. a pretty good job. Yeah. I'm sort of surprised they didn't like buy no. the house well, or did funny. that happen eventually? I, I, no, that's because of the matriarch in the middle. And there's many stories to tell about that too. And my mom later, but she worked at Davidson's lab up at Stevens sure. for many, many years. And uh, which was great for me as a young guy, because I don't know if people knew, know, but they used to test the uh, Apollo uh, space module, landing modules there in those big tanks. So we would, you know, as a young boy, you can imagine, we actually it was sort of like being up here in the museum. You'd stand up high and you'd watch down below and they had these wave tanks down there and they'd have uh, 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 models of the actual modules in there to see how, if they would turn or not. And, and it was really a terrific, you know, part of Hoboken. And, and of course, not many, they weren't doing tours back then, right? but I'd go see mom and she was a secretary there. And, sure. Uh, and it worked out, but the reason, so we ended up, we had a house down the Jersey Shore. I was very fortunate because my dad was an educator. So, and he taught in the summer, but we would all go down to a part of Tom's River on Barnegat Bay called Bayshore. And we'd spend the summer down there. So we'd leave and all, a lot of my friends from Hoboken grew up in my building or from 10th and Willow would come and spend weeks or whatever it was at our family house down there. But my grandmother never wanted to move. That's why we never moved. We were going to buy a house on well, the stories tell on um, there were many family friends who lived on 10th Street. Uh, you know where Doris Kina used to live? Sure. Yeah. Um, so between uh, Park and across from Trulio's, which at the time was Fred's and then Hank's and then became Trulio's Market. 
Trulio's market was just a little corner place, uh, and then the, they ended up taking over the whole space after Hanks. But on that block between uh, uh, between uh, uh, Park and and Garden, we were going to buy a, a house there. Uh, and legend was, or story was, I think accurately, my grandmother poo pooed because she didn't want to leave her apartment, and uh, so we ended up staying there until. Um, and then my folks moved to Marine View in 78. And then unfortunately I lost both my parents at a very young age yeah, and, yeah. Uh, in the early 1980s to illness. And, uh, so that changed their trajectory too. I suspect they would have bought a place again in Hoboken um, right. after grandma. She died in like 78, I think she was, mm -hmm. a, she was a tough cookie and right. uh, a great lady, but, a, a real matriarch. You really got to know her. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, just a shout out to Alexander Rosario the uh, Third. <laughs> he was our guest, uh, I believe, last week. It's funny how time goes. And uh, uh, Alex is younger, actually, than both of us. So oh, he true. was telling the There's story. Quite a few people that are younger of, than both that, of us. I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's you know young at heart, or yeah. you know, there's other factors. Absolutely. Um, but uh, Alex gave a great story you know, about growing up Hoboken uh, in the 1980s, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, and 90s. Yeah. So it's always fun to do these programs because every person is seeing Hoboken through that lens of when sure. they're growing up. Absolutely. And those high school yeah. years are the most, you know, formative, Absolutely. I would say. So, you know, we always hear from people, I wasn't here, but we always hear from a lot of people that Hoboken was really struggling in the 70s. Mm. And that's when you're in high school. And they'll talk about, I don't know, they'll talk about the disturbances. Sometimes they'll describe it as riots. They'll talk about really being fearful. Mm -hmm. Don't go west of Willow, all that type of stuff. Sure. What's your take on it for the 70s? Yeah, well, absolutely, 70s were. So I used to, as I mentioned, I went to St. Peter's Prep and I would, um, I have a mixed bag about it. Of course, fires even started then, and you know, fires ended up defining much of our of our childhood here in Hoboken. But even before that, Hoboken, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in the Willow Flats, right? Those were knob and two places. They were tenements, not unlike New York City. So, fires happen in those buildings all the time. So, so that was a normal thing. But then, of course, the, the, the question of arson later. But as a city, for me, it was a mixed bag that way. Um, I can tell you that on Halloween it was a, it was a, you know it was fifty fifty when you walked out your door you know, right. when you came in I I remember one time standing on my stoop and uh, tenth and Willow and I was you know, jacking around with my buddies and and I I somehow said dun 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 and I finished that last note this egg hit me right in the face and it was pouring down my face but worse there were there was some pretty crazy stuff going on you know. Uh, of socks with uh, flour in them, but rocks in them too. And, you know, so it got a little funky right. that way. And there was violence. But for me, it was a great place of exploration at that time too. You know, it was um, a real free city. You know, uh, one of the great things that, a uh, fun story I love to tell is when my latter years of high school, I used to walk up Willow Avenue with John Lally, the Lally family, a very uh, another Hoboken family of some, of some, years in town and uh, uh, from the Irish projects a lot they lived over by uh, the bamboo uh, behind the high school field there and um, but we used to walk up Washington Street sometime and John liked to have a, a beer or two even in high school so we'd stop in the brass rail and uh, so like 17 maybe and and Washington Street was empty you know, there was, I mean, I don't know what employment rates were there, but, you know, Hoboken was suffering like New York City was suffering at the time when, uh, you know, when uh, President, what's his name, said, you know, drop dead to... Uh, I think Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, to, right. Uh, so Hoboken had dropped dead, too. It was really yeah. a tough town at the time. And But we'd go into the brass rail, and it would be 3.30 in the afternoon or whatever, and there was a guy, Francis, at the bar, and he, another Hoboken legend. I'm sure people maybe not see this today, but are of Hoboken years, they'll know who Francis. So his name was Francis and he had a dog named Francis. <laughs> and the only people at the bar were Francis and his dog Francis. <laughs> and we'd hang out and we'd have a, now, of course Hoboken was a working man's town. So like the bar I grew up over, they'd have stuff like Pabst Blue Ribbon, Schaefer, 
you know, uh, up those uh, Ballantine from Newark, those kind of beers. But at the Brass Rail, they'd have Dab. And so you can imagine being not, so I got culture, you know, from a very young German age. German culture. I had German culture. I was drinking German beers at 17 at the, um, so, so it, was a, it was a mix that way. Sure, it was, <clears throat> you know, it was dangerous, but I was an athletic kid. So that was always a little bit of an entree into diverse communities. Hoboken had become uh, a large and uh, young man, a Rosario young man, it was, I'm guessing is Puerto Rican. And uh, so the large Puerto Rican community then, the bar I grew up over, there were, um, you know, uh, racial things that would happen there. You know, I was fortunate in my family, you know, as I mentioned, we got out of Hoboken a good bit. So we were, I think, you know, we'd opened up to other cultures and people. So they used to, uh, the Puerto Rican Day Parade would come down through Hoboken and it would make its way, I guess, from Washington over to Willow. And then it would turn on 10th Street and go down to uh, uh, Columbus Park. And these guys, you know, they were all, you know, longshoremen guys and they worked for Ferguson Propella. They worked at all these different places and they would park their cars close to the corner and they would sit out front in their lawn chairs and uh, so that the floats couldn't make the turn so they could cause a ruckus. So, so there was that tension in town and um, that was occurring. But for me, you know, I, I, I didn't get so immersed in that, you know, uh, as so many other people. Of course, the fires were a whole nother story. And I actually have, a, as you know, I'm a writer and I've written about them quite a bit and, uh, and uh, became a defining thing, not only for myself, but for so many people in town, sure. you know, uh, when that occurred in town too. So. A shout out from Tom DePaul. Hey, Tom. Uh, he's really into it. And oh, thank nice. you. I don't recognize that name. So maybe a first time listener. Terrific, and that's Tom. great. Um, and so if you went to other towns like Jersey City or mm. Union City and you said you were from Hoboken, <laughs> would they kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, was give a you a... It was like interesting a, going to prep because that was a, an so island. tell us about prep. This is yes. a private school, St. Peter's prep, St. Peter's in prep, Jersey City, yeah. right? And um, everybody from here will know what is prep, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot of families their kids go there. And uh, right, Fred Beto is a prep graduate, okay? <laughs> there we go, throwing a name out. I know he's involved sure. at the museum, uh, <clears throat> but um, so. St. Peter's Prep is, was, is in downtown Jersey City, is a, is a Jesuit uh, school. We, we were raised Catholic. My father was predominantly a Protestant, but uh, we were raised in that uh, white uh, lace Irish family from my, although I'm not really that much Irish, it's interesting, I've done my genealogy now, but we went to OLG. There's a great picture of my, OLG did a, I don't know if it was their 100th or 75th year, they did a, a magazine a few years back and uh, I was going through and there's a picture of my dad um, in his basketball uniform in like fifth grade at, mm -hmm. uh, at OLG. And both my mom and dad met there at OLG. They both went there as little kids uh, and they ended up, you know, being a couple and marrying for so many years. But uh, prop, oh, we got some pictures, forgot. Oh Land, yeah, there's mom. Land, there's Lance. Uh, that's Virginia. That's an OLG outfit she's wearing there. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's the school. One of those, uh, yeah, black and white photo, hand colored, maybe, yeah, then, yeah, or an yeah. early color photo. I can't maybe, tell. No, you're right. Maybe very was. classy. Yeah, right? isn't it great? yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's very wild. cool. That's Virginia yeah. Claire. You know, we're probably going to jump into sure. later years, but we probably should do a few of the photos that are Absolutely sure. earlier years. So and I ran... apologize, I wasn't able to get as many over to you. No, you uh, did fine. You did fine. <laughs> years. And so there's mom, obviously. Yeah, Virginia Claire. And there's dad in uh, in uh, serving in uh, in World War II. He, right. Uh, he was a pilot, and uh, he's an interesting guy. He grew up. My grandmother's. Uh, they lived on Sixth Street between, uh, right up from the uh, the Foster House. Uh, yeah. Uh, they lived on uh, not your Foster. The uh, no the the Stevens. Ste uh, yeah. The, the uh, uh, wayward mother's home. No 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 no. The uh, the. Oh, Stephen Foster, Stephen Foster, the singer, yeah, the singer on Bloomfield. Yeah, which has the yeah. plaque on it. Right. So they're between Bloomfield and Garden on the uh, opposite the, the Italian club there. Right. Now it has a garage down below. It's one of the only ones oh, in wow. Yeah. Uh, 
so my grandma lived down there my um and then later my uncle his brother lived on the next floor and then my uh my other uncle on top all veterans of world war ii oh, and yeah. veterans did your dad uh you know see combat or no he didn't uh, see combat yeah he didn't see combat but he right. was a trainer a pilot trainer and mm -hmm. uh and, and you know and, and maybe he did you know i you know there's stories he would you know like a lot of a lot of uh world war ii guys he didn't really tell those Talk stories about you right know? so so whether he flew missions or combat is right. you know it's a, a fine line in between sure there, so, sure uh, but he would not tell those stories. and that's not hoboken i can that's tell from hoboken. the folio so he was stationed in um obviously overseas and, and the channel islands but then also um in uh, texas and uh and in uh carlisle pennsylvania those okay the places he was sure yeah, yeah. sure but he was and there's dad and mom i think this is the union club in, very classy in Hobo. is that a great picture? Yeah, yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah that's uh you know so they must be in their 20s there you know mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, going off to war you know or whatever right it was and, yeah i'm not sure how we'll know if it's really the union club so we'll just say it, it no is. i think it was yeah okay I think it was yeah yeah which was most people you know newcomers would not know right right right, right that right. was the that was the w uh, uh -huh, exactly ho the not the hotel but the w party rooms of its day yeah in, in and, fact i know it was too because they would tell stories from this actual picture uh-huh yeah. and uh banquet hall and mm -hmm. you know nightclub exactly and so exactly. on Hudson and, Street, right? yeah where was it uh it's on the corner of uh sixth and hudson or right around there yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's diagonal it's, to stevens it's, and yeah it's we, now, we have okay. several good friends who live there now. oh is that right oh, yeah barbara great. gross lives there oh, now, terrific. Wow. so on there many a party there yes yes <laughs> and pat sampiri's family owned it and oh pat, is that right pat lives in town Oh, terrific. Yeah. So he'll know where it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a she, but a it's she. fine. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> and uh, where's this? That's New York City. That's, okay. As I told you, you know, we would, uh, you know, my dad would go to teach and he'd let us roam the streets. Wow. And me and my brother, we'd, uh, we'd. Uh, you like shining shoes or? We you, did no. everything in that city, man. <laughs> we, we, uh, we lived the city life. You know? Right. We really. The phone so booth fooled me. I thought it was like England because of the <laughs> red phone booth, you know. But the, I just added it. Yeah. And that ear over there, that's my, he lived downstairs from us. That's Keith Dytel. Okay. The great Dytel family. They worked at, uh, his dad worked at uh, Colgate Palm Olive for uh -huh. well over 30, 40 years. His brother Wayne was a many, many years in the Navy, a decorated guy and really, um, you know, real Hoboken veteran. I mean, he might still, I know he's retired now, I'm sure, but, right. but, uh, all these people get to retire. I when know, do we right? get to yeah, retire? With that, yeah. you know? and those haircuts were my dad's specialty. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it looks, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I won't go there. Yeah, um, and we, the, yeah, saw that one, we right? saw that. But you get to see about our heads in front yeah, of yeah, 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 And yeah. classic holiday yeah, party exactly. tree in the yeah. background. And it's very people funny growing dressed. up over a bar, but you know, my parents didn't drink at all. They were well, that's not true. In the summertime, they'd have a Tom Collins. We serve glasses yeah. at the that's Union true. Club. That's true. That's yeah. true. Legend would be later. Yes. But you know, when you grow up over a bar, you know, there's you know, and it's interesting, you know, because my kids, I have two wonderful kids, a shout out to Amelia and Owen. And yeah. uh, and, uh and also to my lovely Cheryl, who's out in Shelter Island right now. Say hello to her too. And sure. uh, I think she's watching. And my dear brothers, Tom and Rich, uh, who I think are watching and they're Bonnie and uh, Scott, both their partners as well too. And my sister, Mary, sister-in-law who grew up on First and Willow and my oldest brother uh, who just passed away in May, he was married to her. They were married for 52 years. Mm -hmm. Great story, great Hoboken story. They both went to Hoboken High School. They graduated the same year, except you had two graduations then. Right. And um, so they didn't know each other at all. Oh, really? He went to Rutgers. She went to Jersey City State, or worked, I think it was what it was called back then. She goes to a party at Rutgers, meets him there. They fall in love. They're married for. Uh, they could have started so much earlier. Exactly. <laughs> it could have been like the, uh, my parents, but it's a great Hoboken story. Sure. To see with them. Yeah. And so was it, I'm thinking the bar, was it like really noisy? Yeah, not we were two floors up. Okay. Imagine, yeah, but it was noisy. But you know, not you know between the noise there and the noise, uh, it was like growing up in a you know in a uh, uh, you know in, in a 
like had in the hot tin roof neighborhood, you know, because you'd have the traffic going on right on on Willow Avenue because that is a I think it's still a county road, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and there's yeah. more ambulances ever. Well, you're on more, Willow, right? So that's yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so. definitely. Yeah. And here's a one of the great snowstorms, uh, one of the blizzards in Hoboken. And yeah, we create tunnels. Uh, I can see kind of a little structure there, exactly right? yeah, in the background. Yeah. And we create a tunnel all the way down the block. Uh, you know, from mm. our place to, uh, and that's our stoop there. That's uh, excellent. Tenth and Willow, and those special winter hats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like a Christmas story, right? And yeah, no, <laughs> we didn't good. lick anything with our tongues though, and get it stuck. You know, right. <laughs> and that's a uh, Columbus Park in the field, the JFK Field. Used to have a, a big backstop there. I think it's still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played a ton of basketball there. I ended up playing ba quite a bit of basketball all my life, and still play a little bit. And uh, and that's uh, that's where I learned, and that was our home away from home. And uh, you know, the parks got a little funky in that latter years, um, but at this age, it was still you know uh, a place you could hang out. You know, but like parks around New York City and parks in Hoboken, you know, and, and like you were talking about in the seventies. It became a little more, uh, a little more active, right? So, sure. So. And but think of if when you walk around now, the parks they're mm -hmm. just amazing. amazing. The equipment, unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah, the amount of yeah. you know how this people is, are using yeah. them. This is Go ahead. Cas this is a uh, uh, Castellinos, yeah. And uh, this isn't me. This is my brother Bob. But I just shared it because I was grabbing pictures to show. Uh, Hoboken and it's you know in its heyday. So we're Willow, or yes, it's Willow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's right it, outside our place. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> a classic shot. Isn't I it? Just great? love the the look and the swagger yeah, 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 and yeah. Uh, and the feet. The, yeah, you know, the pants. I think he's got cons on there. Yeah. <laughs> I used to wear pro and what's G, what's G? Yeah. <laughs> what's again? The, the hat. G. Oh yeah. I I you know I I, I thought he played for Casalinos, but I, he wasn't because it's G. Yeah. So. Um, I have to ask my other brother. I, we have a picture of the, they won the championship and I have that picture, but I thought it was, maybe they play for another team too. Right. So. And that's, uh, he's got catchers. I was going to say he's got catchers. Yeah. yeah. That's definitely. probably why he's not happy. <laughs> yeah. His hand still hurts. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. I thought I'd share that just too. Really okay. Yeah. So let's jump forward sure, to, sure. you know, we we're, we were probably high school, high school, you're graduating 76. Yeah, uh, and yeah. what happens after that? Well, I went to um, uh, first. I went to Duquesne University for a while out in Pittsburgh, where my son is now. And uh, if anybody's interested, he'll be playing on national TV next Thursday night. Wow! Uh, uh, he's a big football player at the University of Pittsburgh, so and he's a big kid. He's a big kid. He's like yeah. four of me. Yeah. Okay. So, but a terrific young man. He's yeah. A really bright guy and. Uh, very well diversified, just fell in love with the sport and, uh, and plays it. So, um, and then my daughter's in Pennsylvania as well, too. She just got married in May. Um, but for me, I went to Duquesne, <clears throat> but unfortunately my parents were very, very sick and, uh, had to make my way back. I took a year off. And then I, <clears throat> when you went to St. Peter's prep, you were scholarship to St. Peter's college, which is now St. Peter's university. And, you know, we had two, you know, two dimes to, Put sure. There. So I uh, went to St. Peter's and got my degree from there, uh, graduated in 82 and um, and then began uh, first. I had a really amazing job when I got out of school. I was a, an assistant to a Sports Illustrated photographer. His name was Walter Yost, uh, one of the great uh, sports photographers in America from South Orange, New Jersey, one of the original Sports Illustrated guys. Mm -hmm. uh, he tells great stories of which I can imagine doing now or like when we were growing up, he he would shoot his friends playing f whatever sport in South Orange. And then he just walked over to uh, the offices of Sports Associates, showed him his high school pictures, <clears throat> and they ended up hiring him. And, and yeah, he's a legendary photographer. The iconic images of, of Michael Jordan are his. Um, I got to travel around the world with him for a number of years because he was uh, hired by Fuji Film to document athletes for the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. So we went to everywhere to um, 
to wh wherever the events were happening. So it was a terrific number sure. of years. Sure, I don't, I don't, I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah. I know that photographer not super well, but the jobs and the level you're talking about is yeah. like the height of that craft. It is really the height of the craft, and and, and of course Walter became. What his images were interesting about them, not to digress on him, but is that he went behind the scenes with athletes. He didn't just photograph the action. So there's amazing images of them contemplating before a fight or great images of, uh, of um, you know, runners before they're about to run, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing, or divers. And, and then there's a book called Shooting for the Gold. I was fortunate enough to write the, the prologue to it. And, um, and that was about our experience of putting together uh, this tour and it, it, the photographs he, for Fuji, and of course they were, they were sponsored. They had the blimp there for the Olympics and stuff. And, uh, and he, uh, there were museums around the country, like, uh, National Geographic Museum in Washington and, mm -hmm. uh, and other places too. So it was, it was a terrific time. And I did that till about 80, you know, for, I guess, maybe I even knew you then. And, um, and then right after that, I came back into Hoboken. And uh, so having coming from a father who was an artist and I was just an aspiring writer myself, I've been fortunate to be published a couple of times and in some newspapers, et cetera. Um, I'll tell a story about that later. But the um, I had met a, a woman in town, Susan Shafton, and she had a, uh, a her own studio on Monroe Street. And in the window, it said Monroe Electric, and uh, and that was her studio. And there was a little apartment in the back where she lived at the time. She was from New York City, and you know we became uh, uh, partners together, and and it just organically the place turned into a place called the Oro Electric Art Space, and that's where I met this great young man next to me, who's older than me but younger in heart. But he uh, um, that was uh, it was called Monroe Electric, so. We just scraped the M and the N off the window, and it became the Oro Electric Art Space. And, uh, and that was a we had a terrific run there. We did a we received a number of grants, got a, quite a few stories in places like the Village Voice of uh, how it was uh, uh, you know a spawning ground for young artists of whether they were musicians, writers, photographers like this tremendous photographer next to me, uh, Bob Foster, who I fell in love with his work back then, and. Um, and uh, and Susan was a potter and a painter, and we would do these shows. But what we would do is we would integrate the community into it too. It was a predominantly Latino community in that neighborhood. I think it might still be for the most part. And uh, right around the corner from the projects, between Third and Fourth and Monroe Street, and we did a whole summer program there for kids. And for all our shows and exhibits, a lot of great famous jazz artists would come there and hang out. And, um, we have the kids work the events so that they were an integral part of it too. And, and Bob were, and I were reminiscing before this, remembering some of the names of the kids who were really, really, really terrific young people. You know, um, it, I mean, it was an amazing place that you guys created. I was lucky enough to, I don't think I was there like, you know, when it first started, but pretty, close, pretty, pretty early. Close. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Basically, we there was a rent, and uh, do you remember what the rent was? Oh my, I don't. But yeah. it was less it was, than nothing. Yeah. It was <laughs> like five hundred bucks, maybe, yeah, 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 for yeah. the space. Right, right. And we're talking a storefront that might have been <laughs> four hundred and fifty square feet. Yeah, exactly. It was small. It, was it had small. two bay windows, exactly, or you know, like storefront pop yeah, exactly. out windows, yeah, yeah. but it was small, and was not, you know, just about as simple as you could be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the things that went on there for, I'm not sure how many years, was it four or five or is six, it more six? six? six okay. Six, yeah. The things that went on there for any artist coming to town was an amazing opportunity to sort of create something special that yeah, linked with the community. Tim, Tim Daly made a great, hi Tim, if you're watching, um, Sheila. Right, uh, right. Actually, that shirt has a different. Oh, it's a different. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Don't, we, but, we, uh, we did a uh, show called Heaven, Hell, or Hobo. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, it predates uh, Tim Daly, that's for sure. But well, this shirt, I mean, Heaven, Hell, or Hobo. The, the expression, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it goes back to World War One. Of course. But yeah. it is also the time period of the fires, yeah. uh, mid-80s, that's for right. sure. And Nora, I think, and, 
was one of the few play, first places she showed her film, right? Was at the I'm not going to remember that totally. I think so, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, she could have, but we could have maybe had 20 people in there. Absolutely. Tops. Absolutely. It was very tiny. Yeah, but yeah. think about poets like Joe Weil. Joe Weil. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. One of the great. And Perry Robinson. One of the great world's jazz. Um, it, it was Earl Robinson played at the that's right at the Oro. That's right. Earl is one of America's great composers. Sure. So uh, I was I felt really lucky, yeah. you know, to be there at that time. It was terrific. And but yeah. uh, well, we would have people. I mean, mostly would be out on the street in front. A hundred people or more would come to these shows, and the space could only hold like yeah, twenty five people was, inside it. But, right. But one of the great we had the, tell the, a really the, good Oro story. Well, Can, well a fun fact is that Lauren Hill and the Fugees were they were high school kids from South Orange, New Jersey, show me my face with your fingers two times that she sang later. They played at the Oro okay. as young uh, uh, artists, uh, Wycliffe Jean, uh, um, Jean, how he pronounces his name. I can't remember how I got them to come there, but they performed at the Oro and um, as maybe like 13, 14 year olds. And uh, of course, now they're legends in in Amer American music. So, but we had many many shows. I think the Heaven Hill or Hoboken show, which was, was primarily an art show, was an art show. Yeah, yeah. and um, I think Tim Tim, uh, and that's why I mentioned him. He made uh, the poster for that beautiful show. poster, really which good. unfortunately we can't show you. It's in a flat file somewhere. Oh, it's in, flat it's flat in the museum yeah. archives, and but. it's really an iconic uh, picture. And uh, Tim and Sheila, who've been in Hoboken many years now, uh, both, uh, I, I guess they met at the Oro. I may be wrong about that, but they uh, <laughs> I don't know. They both were down there, and Sheila was a photographer at the time and was really photographing Hoboken for, um, you know, there was a, so many, you know, the, the, the tension in town between gentrification and born and raised and, and the, the poorer community in town and and, and the city that we we're in now, you know, um, uh, was really occurring at the time. I was a, a little bit of a strident writer and poet back then. Uh, and um, uh, I remember writing a poem about it, you know, at the time that uh, sticks in my head and was fortunate enough to have it published somewhere. But, uh, and I know Bob brought the uh, Yuppies Invade Hoboken books, uh, which kind of tell the stories of that a little bit at that time. You know, right. Uh, the gentrification that was happening in town and um, and you know and the, and the movement of a culture that was in the city uh, but you know the the thing i always try to remember about cities is that they don't survive if they don't you know different decades or times they change but as a young person in the fires in town that exhibit was um you know i i, I, have, I have some pride in that it really uh, sure really told you know Picked a moment. I mean, there were terrible fires and many, many children dying in them and, and families. And uh, so it, uh, it really spoke to that period. And I would say a lot of the artists were just finding Hoboken their home. That's right. And weren't quite sure how to address the fires. Right. And, uh, you know, th 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 there's so many things that go through your head. Sure, sure. But it was a way, it was cathartic for the artist to was, take too. that yeah, yeah, subject yeah. matter on. Yeah. And it was the theme of the exhibit. It was. Some more direct than others. Absolutely. And uh, some who had been here longer. Uh, right. Do you like remember? Or... Right. Do you remember? I think it's the <laughs> same show, but uh, Mrs. Seidensall, April's do. mother. April's mom. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Who she. Um, <laughs> She was upset that I think yeah. the con, no, which school uh, was being converted into condos? Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, David E. Rue. Uh, was it? Oh, gosh. Because Rue now, is con Rue It's now the Citadel. The oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so Linkoff School. Linkoff School. And that, and Sadie Linkoff so, School. So, so you, know, you know, we live in a, in a PC world now of some, some degree, but so I think that's Frank Reyes place, right? So, right. Uh, uh, well, uh, sort of. Well, yeah. well yeah. he was the developer. Yeah, Frank. I think you know, then you, I know Frank for many, many years. Uh, puppy. But uh, the uh, you now I always get them mixed up. You know, when you're a kid growing up in Hoboken, so like the neighborhood I grew up in, we didn't. And I say these things because it's just the way we spoke back then. So I was, even though I'm not predominantly Irish, I was poly Irish. And then there was Johnny Hugo, 
and there was Freddie Regan, and there was Big Black Sam, who was my one of my dearest friends. But that's the way we just talked back then. You know, of course, not today in the way we speak, but uh, but it really that school, I think, was the school for kids who were uh, challenged. And uh, so we always had affectionate names for that school too, you know, at that right. time, which then became Condo. So like the, I think, no, I may be wrong, but I think my brother tells me it wasn't that school, but the Yellow Bus School, you know, that was- Right, yeah, right. So. Sometimes I hear that story and they're talking about Connor's school. Right, because she might have been, uh, might but, have been Connors, yeah, Right. Yeah. Um, and, but she uh, came and see But <laughs> she was very upset because she had gone to that school. So like, oh, yeah. And at that time, you know, schools were really you know the, we had too much too many too much space right, shall right, we say right, right, right. so the city saw it as an opportunity mm -hmm. to uh not maintain them and to right. sell them Absolutely. Yeah. but other people felt mm -hmm. like what if we need the schools later which ironically came to be true yeah, okay, sure. yeah. uh, but uh, I I remember getting in a big fight with you oh, oh, with her right? exhibit. Oh, yeah, no kidding! No because kidding. <laughs> uh, what was April's mom's name? I don't remember um, the story. So yeah, it's so it's I'm yeah, and I'll make it quick. Wendy, I so, think. could uh, be. And I'm friends with her on Facebook. I I, I know April really well. April's been on the show. Oh, okay. And but her mom Maybe was an artist, wrong, so. and but you could be right. Yeah. But um, and so she. For her thing, I think I said, why don't you just write out your story right on the wall, mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. on the plaster yeah, yeah, yeah. in pencil? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you you being the proofreader, you found errors oh, in, her, <laughs> in her grammar oh, or something in her man. spelling. And <laughs> oh, we, it I, didn't I actually, come to blows, uh -huh. but it was like, don't touch that wall. Those are her writing. And you were there with the, you know, oh, the gummy eraser funny. ready to do it. That, that, that comes but, from my, my uh, father. But actually, I, in, in retrospect, I acquiesce because okay. it should be authentic to right. what her word was. Yeah, so that's <laughs> that funny. was the sense. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And uh, that's she had learned spelling at the school. So hence, <laughs> no, whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, we got into a I'll lot of detail there. I wrote this collection of short stories, uh, Mango Shoes which unfortunately I wasn't able to bring with me from where I came, but it's really stories about growing up in Hoboken. Oh, there it is. Thank you. That's the cover. That's right. the cover. And I got to, you know, I draw the, drew the cover of that as well. It's too. a nice cover. I like that yeah, cover. Thanks. Yeah. And that's the back end of town by the mm -hmm. mighty fine building back downtown. Gotcha. And, um, and, uh, and I used to sketch and stuff a lot, but, but, um, uh, why was I bringing up Mango Shoes? The, uh, <laughs> stories, proofreading, was there a oh, connection? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. That's the reason. So um, there was, what was uh, the bookstore in Hoboken that, uh, what's, he's the travel writer now? Yeah. Rogers and Cogswell. Yeah. Yeah, Rogers and Cogswell. Thank so, you, Rand. Thank you, Rand. So the voice is coming from above, yeah. yeah. So I, um, I when, when Mango Shoes came out, and it was published by NYU Press, the, um, the, uh, um, I got to read it there. And in one of the stories I write about uh, uh, sneakers hanging on wires. And, uh, and and it's it's sort of, a lot of the stories are written in that magical realism tradition of Marquez and writers like that. Uh, and um, so a guy ends up, so based on people I knew, Joey Reyes, who was, we used to play uh, Johnny on the Pony with, and he was an amazing, he could jump and land. He was like he'd hover in the air above you and like pick out the weakest link in the neck, which is usually me, and land on it and then make the whole pony collapse. So if people don't know Johnny on the pony, they can look that up. And if we played bottle caps on the street. He would, he would, you know, you used to have those long tubes filled with uh, colored uh, liquids oh, in them. Oh yeah, they were gross. They were gross, but you would you would drink that and then you chew the wax and you would put it in your in your bottle cap. Like this. I was like the YooHoo kid. But Joey was the kid who could fling it down the block, you know. So, so in my story, I throw, I step in shit in my sneakers. You can say shit right on this, right? So he, uh, he, um, uh, and because of the in, in this book, they talk about in Hoboken there were many sneakers that would hang on wires, and from in my generation, it was really just a, a rites of passage. It had nothing later mythology or maybe truth in some neighborhoods in the city was to mark gang territories or whatever but not for us it was just to throw your sneakers up there and uh in the story i step in dog shit their new sneakers i throw them up there i uh, uh, uh 
I later realized they're brand new sneakers. So I get my friend Joey to come there and walk out on the wire to grab my sneakers. And it creates a whole, uh, 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 much of excitement on the street below. He falls down, hits a hot dog wagon. By the way, there's an incredible hot dog wagon here at the museum. It's true. Which you really have to come and see. I, and I know there's going to be a, uh, a, a film uh, about hot dogs here. So, uh, a hot dog wagon. Thank you for the plug. Of course. Yeah, definitely. Course. Always something going on. Yeah, it's such a spectacular sure. place here. So, I plug it all day. But I tell the story because I'm in Rogers and Cogswell and I'm, and I'm reading this story and I step in shit and I, and I'm, and it's kids talk back then. There's like cursing in and stuff. And there was a woman in the crowd. Her name was Mrs. Ortega, a good friend of my mom and dad's, the Ortega family. She's Cuban, elegant, beautiful woman sitting in the back. You don't say that and, in front of her. Well, the thing is, I'm reading the story, and she comes back up to me, and she's, Paul, such beautiful stories, but why so many curse words? And I said to her, I said, well, you know, I was trying to be authentic. People say, well, they may have, but they shouldn't have spoken that way, you know? So I tell that story because, you know, that carried with me, and... Maybe that's why I was rubbing her stuff on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I get the connection, I think. <laughs> um, and just Mrs. Ortega is not with us anymore, but I know exactly who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Very her and her friend. husband were the best dressers in Hoboken. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he worked in the tire plant. Absolutely. And Absolutely. She was, you know, raised a family. Matt, Matt and Maddie's in, in Puerto Rico now. That's and right. Two sons. Two sons. And, yeah. Uh, my two older brothers were, uh, <laughs> that's great. All right. Uh, Johnny and the Pony and Bottle Caps was great. Yeah, great yes. games. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and and we played flies up on the corner where you knock the ball off the off the curve and, and uh, into uh, the building next to you. But uh, the Ortegas were, the two sons were very good friends with my two oldest brothers. Okay. And our parents True. were very good friends. Yeah. Too, so, yeah. No, uh, very she, lovely, lovely. We did a chat book interview of her. And, oh, no kidding. Uh, you know, sort of, I'll give it, give you one oh, downstairs. Yeah, It'll yeah. kind of bring back because her, her mm -hmm. voice is really in the book, the uh, way it's transcribed. Such an elegant, you know, really tasteful woman too. Sure. And, I mean, that's, that's one of the great things about Hoboken is you can connect so strongly with someone which might have been through their kids or through their yeah, pets absolutely. or just walking down Washington absolutely. Street. Absolutely. And I always maintain, you know, it's probably not going to happen growing up in the suburbs as much. No, uh, no, no. You know, I mean, you make it, it seems to be more of a connection through uh, the kids and the sports absolutely. and the summer yeah. program, school, but know. not so much walking down the absolutely. driveway. When you grow up over a bar, <laughs> the connections you're making, uh, it just made me think of a, of a, of a, of an image. And it's because we were talking about bottle caps, which we play on the street. And, uh, and we also flick baseball cards against the wall. Maybe the gentleman who was just loving uh, Eric and flipping cards, you know, Eric's so, probably uh, flipping cards right now. <laughs> we're putting them on his bike. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that was a big thing, particularly the, so I actually have a film I've written. It's called uh, For Sale to Juan Diaz Social Club. And it's a story of um, that time period of Hoboken um, and kids I grew up with who were and, and very, very, as I mentioned those names before of, of, uh, of uh, Freddie Rican and, and Johnny Hugo. These were all, you know, we were all just part of a community. So, but when the fires were happening, then the, the opening scene in the film that I've written is, is a, a lot of, particularly Puerto Rican guys would deck out their bikes and they, they put a transistor radio in the middle of it and they put a big tire in the front and they put colored things or baseball cards. So it would flick in the front. And uh, so in my film, the, the beginning, or at least in the writing of it, the opening scene is from that bicycle from by, and scenes of Hoboken as you're going through and the Beatles song places I remember in my life, but in Spanish is occurring. And then you just see street scenes like you were talking earlier, but on, on Willow Avenue between 9th and 8th, I always remember when I'd walk to prep or St. Peter's Prep, when I'd come back, there was uh, a guy who would pull out his one his seat from his Impala or whatever car it was and have it sitting there and the back wall would be lined with beer cans and he'd have a line of people lining up to get their hair cut in the, <laughs> on that seat, you know, and then I'd be walking by so in my film, that's the kind of things you see as you're as you're going by. Because as you mentioned before, it was stoop life. You know, it was hot in in your in your 
homes or even if you lived in a you know in a brownstone people were hanging out on their stoops so, right so the city was really defined by that and you know as a writer uh, i feel very fortunate that way because sure. it's a, it's just a it's a just a bag of things you can write well the way you described it i can see that tracking shot from the case yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, it yeah. kind of yeah, yeah it's yeah, yeah. Uh, and then i zoom in on a particular stoop which would be mine and it's a bunch of kids there uh from all different ethnicities and they're but they're just kids and they're and they're telling you know just being young people and then the story breaks from there about uh, uh fire but it's really important and when i write that and because they're, they're based on people i knew too because there's always been stereotypes, you know, and so two of the young people in it uh, are, are Puerto Rican and one, so I had friends, one who went to Columbia for journalism school and the other who wanted to be an actor. And uh, I just flipped them, the boy and the girl and, and made them a couple too. So I love the story of, of my friend who, and uh, I won't share his name right now, Eddie, but oh, there it is. But he, uh, he had a, so in the, one of the scenes in the film, I remember we had a big chance to do a Lovoris commercial in New York City, but he, for in for Spanish television, right? So he's a young guy, he's going to do it. So in the film, I have scenes of him. He's uh, first practicing in his bathroom in Hoboken, speaking Spanish, and you know, and, and at the end, he's going Lovoris, right? So so the next scene, he's on the sixty three bus, which now is the one twenty six bus. Uh, uh, shout out to people; they just doubled the number, you know. So. He's riding that bus into the city, and it's a time where people of you know the suburbs had moved into Hoboken, and they were commuting to the city. So he's he's Puerto Rican kid, and he's practicing his lines. And there's a young Caucasian woman. He's kind of looking at her, but through her, and he's speaking Spanish, and she's getting uncomfortable. But at the end of it, he says Lavoris, and so she's kind of struck by it. And then the last scene is back in their apartment in Hoboken with all our friends watching the Lavoris commercial on a Zenith television, which is what we did back in, in black and white. In black no, and, no, it's color. <laughs> no it's color. color. Okay, yeah. cool. No, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I followed those shots. Uh, I saw, so anyway, I saw the close-ups. That's a shout out to uh, for sale the one. Yourself. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, sure, sure. Paul, can you share the story about how you got free shoes from Cusselux? This comes yeah. from Rand who typed it in on the Thanks, keyboard. Thanks, Thanks, yes. Rand. Thanks, Rand. So, uh, uh, the, the, and you I, better set it up. Who? What's yeah, so Casalux? So your friend who was uh, on before, who loved uh, uh, bottle caps and graduated from Hoboken High School. The he, Eric, yeah. Eric, he'll know. Casalux, uh, we called it, but Casalux uh, was a. Um, now it's a restaurant. What's it called? Uh, uh, on the corner Anthony of David. what is it? Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis on the corner of Tenth uh, and Bloomfield, and. It was extended all the way back, and it was Kuslik's shoes. And the fr you you went in a side entrance there, which I think is coffee. It's a tattoo parlor or Caulfield. Ca or it's not Caulfield anymore. Okay, yeah. So it was it was a, a yeah. It, there is a tattoo parlor still there. It's a tattoo parlor. Yeah. that was all Kuslik's. Yep. And the front windows were just filled with shoe boxes, and you came in the side. And of course, he kept his unbelievably super cool car parked on 10th street there for all of my you know childhood growing up and even when i knew you it was sure. parked there yeah. uh for years it would move once a week for, exactly. street, for cleaning. street cleaning yeah yeah but uh the reason man mentions the story is that um uh of course we got our shoes there there in tom mccann's which was up on washington street but uh we go into kuslux because he um and of course, I found this out later. But he had a. Uh, my mom was a, uh, a pinup, a, but a leg pinup in in during World War II. And he had a. And I guess uh, Mr. Kuslick, I, I I think it was Sam. I don't remember. There was Sam. But I always re we'd always just call him Mr. Kuslick because you know we were little kids and we um, we would uh, get free shoes whenever we went there. And you know you know so just part of being part of the neighborhood and we, whatever, you got your shoes. But I later found out I got free shoes because he had a crazy crush on my mom and he showed me her leg fit up in the back. But when you're like 10, 11 years old, you're not really like, yeah, my mom's legs, you know, you're not thinking about it. But but I guess he had maybe, and I, I don't know if he served or not, but maybe he had them in his uh, part of him when he served. Uh, but he had them, he had them hanging up in the back and 
we'd be able to go and like I'd walk in like a kid in a candy store and you'd uh, you'd pick out the shoes you want. And which reminds me of, uh, you know, I know you've did a wonderful thing with uh, the Trulio family here. And um, and I know Joe lost his wife. So I, my condolences to Joe and I've mentioned it to him a number of times. And they were dear friends of ours growing up. And my job was to go over as the youngest of the boys, go over to uh, Trulio's meat market and you get chuck chop, which was uh, ground meat. <clears throat> and then you went across the street and I think it's a bar now, but uh, opposite where uh, uh, they were extended and where they just closed their place. But on the 10th and uh, Park on the south side of the street, the southwest side was Vito and, uh, 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 oh my God, Vito's, uh, uh, fruit, Ralph and Vito's fruit market. And so it was, we really grew up in like a New York City neighborhood. So you get your meat there, then you go over to Ralph and Vito's and Ralph and if Keith is watching or any of the kids in the neighborhood, you'd remember this because he had a stroke and, uh, but we didn't really know what a stroke was. But what we loved was that he would take a brown bag like this and he would line the peaches up on his stroke arm and he would take the peaches and, brrr, and we'd all like sit there and watch to see if all the peaches made their way into the bag and they never dropped the we always went in and then he just gave you the peaches as you walked out the door. And then on the corner, which is where Trulio's Market expanded later, um, uh, when I was a kid, it was a place called Fred's. And Fred then gave it to or Hank. Hank then took over the place. And I think the young the Singleton son ended up working there for a while when he Mark. came to Hoboken. Mark. But um, when I was a kid, it was Fred's. And Fred was, it was a German deli. And I shared a birthday with uh, with Fred's mother, so I tell the story because it was like Kuslux. I I would I would get anything I wanted in the store. So and it, and it just so I'd get uh, and it, it always gave me that you know, that tin of Danish cookies, that oh, yeah. blue tin, you know. That, so I get that, and he make this bread pudding and roast beef. So I guess he got the meat from Trulio's, and that's the same meat that they ended up using for the famous roast beef sandwiches at uh, Fiori's, Fiori's, you know, right. but it really started at uh, Fred's Deli and potato salad and stuff. So I tell those stories because it was really, Hoboken was a neighborhood and a place. So even in the 70s, that was still happening. Muse's store was in the middle of the block. Um, so that's where we got uh, candy. and So there's like the bar of Muse's, but there's also a store? No, or? so the bar was the, bar was, uh, uh, the uptown. And that extended uh, just behind, there's a little walkway down it. And then it, there's a dip between two of the buildings. And that was uh, Muser's. So he owned all of that. He owned the bar. Oh, he owned the bar. And, 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 and then he had his, he had Muser's uh, uh, store there. And you could get cold cuts there. Right. Uh, that kind of stuff. And candy. Now, the reason the Muser family is, uh, you know, and those of us from Hoboken know is that um, Louis Muser Jr., was uh, lost in Vietnam. Right. He was an, an MIA. I actually was going to send his picture. And in my book, Mango Shoes, I it's really sort of an awakening time for me as a young person because he um, I, they used to hang his picture when he was missing in Vietnam, right. a place where I would get uh, jellyfish candies. Now I had a picture of somebody, and it would say MIA, and 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 they became, obviously they were much more their whole demeanor had changed because their son was missing in Vietnam. And, and, and there were a lot of Vietnam guys around. So they, it was a defining time for me as a young person, as you're growing up, because they would tell their stories, you know, of, uh, of, of that time period. And, and Hoboken had a lot of Vietnam vets, you know, who came back, this, you know, disfigured. And, and Louis Misa Jr., um, for some whatever reason, so I wrote this story about him and have visited his... Uh, his name at the uh, wall down in. So he didn't come back. He didn't come back. He was right. KIA. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. They, um, his helicopter crashed. And, and again, I don't want to miss tell the story. So as I recall it, his helicopter crashed. And, um, and by his dental records, they were able to, after quite a bit of time, though, he had been, uh, they thought he was a prisoner, et cetera. And, uh, and he had passed away. Yeah. Right. right. I'm sure Joe knows, because Joe was a, I don't know if Joe served in Vietnam, but the Korea. Joe Joe Trulia? Yeah. No, not Korea. No. no? I don't think I'm so. I'm not sure. Maybe, okay. maybe Vietnam. He was in the service. Yeah, but... I think he was in Vietnam. So Joe right. will know. Uh, right. 
uh, Lewis historian. Right. Um, but they were a terrific family. We called him Mr. Clean because as kids, because he had a bald head. Big guy, right? Big I remember guy. him. And he yeah. was kind of mean. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little scary. But... Yeah, a little scary, little kids. and Right. So, um, but those are all great Hoboken stories. Sure. Uh, well, um, it's, you know, this idea that growing up in Hoboken has really uh, helped formulate you. Oh, sure. Right? Sure. I mean, these absolutely. people, you they're still with you. Yeah. yeah Most yeah. of them have moved on, yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah. but they're still with you. So that's I'm looking over to the corner here. Of, there's a great little sign here for Stan Sporting Goods Place. And uh, I've, being an athlete all my life. Oh, you're at the exhibit. Yeah, I'm looking at yeah. the exhibit. I'm looking at the screen. I go, what are you talking about? I'm looking at the exhibit there. Sure. And there's a Stan sign. And, you know, and I spent many a day in stands growing up. So. Right. So yeah, Hoboken's been, uh, you know, and as I say, cities change and the Hoboken that my parents grew up in was the Fabian and, uh, you know, very different city. One of my earliest memories is the ferry, uh, not the ferry now, but the, the big ferries that left, uh, you know, from uh, the Hudson Terminal there and jumping over the space to to go on those. But I think those ended like 66. So I was, Something around there. So I was yeah. pretty young. And probably a little cheaper than the ferry <laughs> ride today. Yeah, yeah, which I took today, which yeah. is like, uh, I had to cough up a little blood to pay that. Yeah, money. yeah. But, sure. uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, but, um, you know, as a writer, it's, I feel like I've been very fortunate to have a muse mm -hmm. and that's the city. And, um, so, you know, and there are many, many wonderful people who have come through the city and continue to, you know, and, uh, and I know here at the museum, there are a lot of people who have embraced it and embraced that past too. So that's why I think this is such a, for all of you, you know, and if anybody watches this outside, the many who are already converts, it's a, it's a place. And I tip my hat to Bob for what he's done here too. So. And, and there's a lot of us who make it happen now. Oh, I'm sure. yeah, I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. Um, so and Jim Hans and you know Jim Hans is the founder of the museum. Yes, yeah, is true. And a, and a dear friend. Too. Yes. Um, so we're kind of winding down. Is there? Do you want to cover any other turf here, or do you? I mean, I think you did a pretty good job we covering did a, it. We did a little dancing here. Yeah, throughout definitely. The, throughout the town, um, you know, we could tell these stories, and you know, I, 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 the the uh, James Joyce, the great writer, said when he moved to France was because. Uh, he always thought the uh, the Irish could all be great, great writers, except he moved because, but they talked too much, you know, and uh, he moved to France. So because you know, they, when he talked, nobody would know what he was saying. So he wrote it down instead, too. That's and, right. So that's why I'm out of Hoboken more than in it now these days. But I love to come to the city and and embrace the light and the, you know, and the, and the, the newness of it, plus the oldness of it. And to see the city now, when I was growing up here, it was filled with kids. And the city's filled with kids now too, and that's a terrific thing. And, sure. Uh, and I love seeing that in the in the city. And, and part of coming here, and to thank you for that, to tell my family story. We're we're many generations in Hoboken. Uh, my children were born here, and um, so we have a great, great love for you know the history of the city, and uh, you know dating back well into the 1800s. So it's a. Uh, I was telling Bob before we started that I have tin types. Uh, outside tin types uh, uh, down on the Hudson here that I'm going to. Or maybe it's on the west side and like when it was flooding. Yeah, yeah it could have been, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'd love to see him. I'd love to see but him. Thank you again for the opportunity. Yeah, to share this you. was great. So Paul Neshampkin. All right, Paul. Hey, Paul. Do you remember Paul? I'm not sure if you I'm did. Sure trustee did, of yeah. the museum hey, uh, was very involved in community issues and uh, and he signed on. Oh, look at this. And do you want to read that one? Your dad, Alfred, was my seventh grade teacher at number nine school, 1956, now Connor School. He was a great artist and a sweet gentleman. Wow. What a wonderful thing. Thank you, say. Pat. Wow. Thank you, Pat. Paul's got a little tear in his eye. I do. I do. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. I received uh, from Roz Brown. Pat might know her. I know you got to go. No, no. But, uh, Roz um, put a Facebook. My father passed away in 1980, so it's many, many years. And uh, so I got a Facebook post from her of how she ended up, um, and I don't know if Roz watches this, but she ended up running the art programs for the city of Los Angeles. And in her Facebook to my brothers and I, it was because of my father, because he gave her pipe cleaners when she was a little girl in an art class and spent all this time with her. 
to make these figures. And she ended up using those in her art throughout her whole life and, uh, and continue to be an artist. She's like my age, maybe your age, mm -hmm. a little older. And, uh, and was able to uh, share those stories. So that's great. And Eric, uh, great job. I follow up afterwards. If you knew my grandparents' store at 9th and Clinton. Uh, which what, store was, what kind of store? Which store? I, of course, you know, the, there was the... There's a little delay, so we may miss yeah, yeah. his comment. Um, 9th and Clinton, so down the, from Seligman's there, right? To, uh, across um, from the high school? Seligman's was the so, pharmacy. Oh, so like, it's still the pharmacy. Still the pharmacy. Yeah. By right. finest? I'm sure it was by finest then. Now CVS? You now CVS, yeah. So, okay, we're going to sort of <laughs> close out here. I knew it. The yes. candy store. I know it well, got many, got many uh, 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 Swedish fish there. Milk duds, milk duds. Yeah, milk duds. <laughs> anyway. No violets, though. No okay. Violets. okay. Oh, I hated violets. <laughs> Me too. Um, so this was another great program and seeing the Hoboken through the eyes of Paul was kind of, was pretty interesting. So thank you, Paul Drexel. And those of you who enjoyed the program, please let other people know that you can watch this archive program plus the other 80 Hoboken Absolutely, talks yeah. on YouTube. We're really creating an archive uh, with these Perfect. programs this for sure like a, um, a, a story uh, court you know it's could really, be could be perfect. or better okay. anyway um so just want to mention uh, you've been watching uh, hoboken talks and soon we'll be doing an interview with kelly clancy and after that with spike Enswiller. so we just keep going on thursday nights and uh we do want to thank uh, some families and some folks who have, you know, uh, inclu included the museum in their estate planning, and that would include Mel Kiernan. Uh, Mel was a longtime supporter, uh, taught at St. Peter's uh, College or oh, University now, and lived on Hudson Street for many years. Uh, in addition, the New Jersey Historical Commission is one of our main funders. Uh, and we thank them a lot, along with the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, who'll be, uh, who've supported, will be supporting us with our next major exhibit downstairs, which will be dealing with the Hoboken fires of the 70s and 80s. Uh, and then there's a special group of people who donate at a high level, in, including our museum trustees. Uh, we call them the Shipyard Circle. And... Uh, these are those folks, too many to mention, mm -hmm. but a lot of people Great make names. the museum work. I recognize many of those names. Yeah. And then Applied Companies, uh, also known as Iron mm -hmm. State, uh, uh, which I refer to as the Barry family. Of course. Uh, they are the, the host of this uh, space that we have here. And uh, we thank them every day, every hour, and every minute we're here. So that's just some of the people who make a program like this possible. And then should mention that, you know, the, the media programs were getting, get a lot of viewers, a lot of listeners, but we still are a museum where you should be walking in the door oh, and experiencing uh, the exhibits. And when you come into the Hoboken Historical Museum, you're generally going to meet someone who really will help you interpret the exhibit if you want that. And uh, we have a lot of volunteers uh, who help out and know the town. And currently the exhibit is The Avenue, A History of Washington Street. And this exhibit will be up until December 23rd. It's still happening. So come check us out. And then in the upper gallery, we have a wonderful set of photographs taken by Carol Halibian. And they're up until September 4th. And we're still doing this project of trying to identify the kids in these photographs. We figure most of the kids who, whose photographs are taken by Carol were about seven, eight, nine years old. And now they'd be about 58. And we've identified, I'm gonna say about half of them. Anyone who can identify themselves in the photograph, we'd love to take a picture of you with that photograph and give you a nice photograph, uh, 11 by 14. You'll have to frame it yourself, but you'll walk out with the photograph. So that's what's going on here at the museum in terms of exhibits. And uh, 
Again, uh, please to subscribe to YouTube. It's our main media platform for getting the word out. And we'd love to get your comments and share with others and spread the word about Hoboken Talks. Uh, and we are the Hoboken Historical Museum. Again, a special shout out to Rand Hoppe, who is uh, the person who came up with this concept and has stuck with it for over a year with more than, we might be a year and a half. I don't know, time flies. So thank you, Rand. Thank you, Rand.